I just want everybody to know that in the beginning, I did forget to introduce myself. I introduced everybody else, but <laughs> not myself. So I'm Megan Benage. I'm a regional ecologist with the Minnesota DNR. And these awesome Miniopa people just let me hang out with them sometimes, which is really nice. And another thing that we want to make sure we cover before we jump right back into the video is covering uh we mentioned that this is a partnership between the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative and the Minnesota DNR. And we just want to make sure people know what the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative is because you absolutely can be a part of it. So Becky, I'm going to share this PowerPoint and then if you could um, talk about it, that'd be great. And I have to go to 72 screens. There we are. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, we just wanted to remind you that uh, and, and give you a little background on um, the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. And so PRI is a community of prairie practitioners and researchers from more than 30 organizations that work together to improve our prairie reconstruction so that they are biologically diverse, are ecologically functional, and resist invasion by non-native plants. So together we focus our activities within two general areas, both evidence-based tools and peer-to-peer -to -peer learning. Our tools include a vegetation monitoring protocol and a prairie reconstruction database for collecting a standard suite of data about reconstructions. And by pooling and analyzing data from many reconstructions, we hope to reveal those pivotal elements that will help increase the likelihood that all of our reconstructions meet our expectations. And our learning opportunities include both in-person and online events such as this, one that we're in today where the PRI community can exchange experiences and knowledge with each other. We believe these insights from both individual experiences and scientific investigations lead to our collective success. And I'll turn it back over to Megan. Great job, great job. Uh, how can people join the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative? Yeah, so if you can um, take a look at the chat there, Jamie Ellis uh, had put the Google website into the chat. Um, and we know that some folks may or may not be able to ac access that website because you can connect with us there um, for more information. Um, if you can't get into the website, please just contact myself, Jamie, or Megan, and we can get you started. And we will type our contact information into the chat so that way you have it and you know how to contact us. So later you're not like, they said I should contact them, but I sure don't know their emails. So we're gonna jump right into, I mean, I shouldn't have favorites, but this is one of my favorite <laughs> modules of the series, which is called the return of the bison. And so again, I know that I shouldn't have favorites, but this is a really good one. Um, just as a quick reminder for video connectivity and everything, we'll have everybody turn cameras off when we play the video. And then on your end, if you have any applications running in the background, you'll want to shut those. If you have devices that you're not using right now that have Wi-Fi turned on, you'll want to turn those off. You can also go to your network settings and see what processes are running in the background, and you can pause those or and or you can also clear your browser caches so that's another way we're going to use the same question and answer padlet that we've been using and you'll notice i'm just turning things pink that we've been answering and then questions that we still need to ask are white and as i say you can see you can't see because i didn't share my screen so <laughs> so as you can see now or i hope you can see i'm turning ones that we've asked pink and the panel participants will still be typing in some answers, even if they answered your question out loud. So without further ado, everybody get your popcorn ready. This is not a ad. This just happens to be a Mankato based popcorn company. And when I opened this bag during our break, it was full. And now it's not. <laughs> That's all we need to say. <laughs> OK. Um. Here we go. And Gwen, do you, do you want to give voice to your comment there or do you or you just want people to see it in the chat? I can say that people want to see it. Um, I just just added in the, the chat that we worked with Frankie Jackson to bring singers from Prairie Island Indian community 
to pray and sing for the bison when they came to Dakota County Park recently. Which I think is wonderful. wonderful. Thank you, Gwen. All right. We're going to start the second video. Get your snacks ready to go. Even though I don't have favorites, this is my favorite. And Becky, if you could just make sure that we have sound. The first day that the bison were yes. here at Miniopa was a day full of excitement and joy and just overwhelming emotions um, to see them come out of the trailer and run into, into the grass and into the prairie. Um, it was as if everything could be new again and restored. Um, it was pretty emotional. There were tears that day <laughs> and laughter and joy. Um, it just seemed so natural that they were here and the way they came out of the trailer and into the, the enclosure area. Um, they just made themselves at home right away as if they had always been here. It was so much anticipation. And when we brought in the first three that was from the zoo and they were late and coming. And usually when you are scheduled for anything as a DNR employee or even any state employee or any employee, you know, you're always thinking about the clock and all that. But I just remember how it was like a joyful, time like we were just all kind of hanging out we got pizza <laughs> delivered from Donimo's I think and we were just really kind of it was like one of those things like we're in the moment and so not only was it our staff or the DNR staff but we had others from the community as part of that and I think that really made it also special that this bison herd is a community effort this would have never happened without Mankato saying, I still want to stay parked without Mankato saying, we'll give you six bison that you can take to Blue Mountains, but someday you have to bring the bison back. And then really having Gwen and Glenn here um, gave us more of a reverence, maybe, even maybe gave us a pause and really how other cultures view this animal and what that it truly means to them. So it wasn't just, we're gonna bring the bison here and here, we're gonna do great things, but really a whole bigger picture than maybe we would ever expected. And we see this when people come here and they thank us. Thank you for bringing the bison in. It's a healing process because of the history of what Mankato was because of that U.S. Dakota war. And so we didn't expect that and I think it's made it much more than what it what we originally thought it would be and what it could have been. So the day that bison came out, I had been planning, you know, all the logistics and all the for years we had been working for this. So when the day actually came, um, I got surprisingly emotional and I wasn't expecting that because I was thinking of, you know, all the details and will the bison be safe and how's this going to work and and the moment when they actually came out there was a storm coming a pretty severe thunderstorm and we weren't even sure where everyone's looking at the radar like are we going to be able to do this and the skies held off and the bison came out and it was just this such a magical moment and i distinctly remember two bald eagles flying overhead and it's common to see them here but they were flying really low almost like they were checking out the new people to the park you know who are these and and it was just right after that, the skies opened up and it just rained. And, but we got that moment of them coming out and it was just, I had goosebumps. Some people, you know, it was just so emotional to have that moment finally happen, all that work. And um, I really underestimated what it would mean for just the community in general, but also like the Dakota people. And they fed us as a community afterwards. And it was just a really great feeling to know that I was a part of that. For me as a Dakota person, having the bison return to this place is 
that continuation of our stories, the continuation of our history and our culture, because we view the bison as our relatives and we treat them that way. We speak to them, we pray for them, we sing for them. And so to see them in this space, in this restored prairie space, as if they had never been gone, um, is, is very powerful, very emotional, very restorative and hopeful. I've noticed it has brought a lot more people into the park. And the first year, the people were just driving in their cars. They weren't hiking or anything. But now I notice a lot more people hiking and out of their cars and hopefully enjoying what Miniopa has to offer, the trees, the rocks, the flowers, and, and just the outdoors. It is a wonderful thing that more and more folks are finding us and more people are visiting this park and getting the opportunity to experience what we have. But with that, it brings a lot of additional issues that we're dealing with. Um, for instance, our falls area with the increased foot traffic, we're seeing a lot of you know beaten down areas and paths, increased erosion along the creek bed, um, things like that. When we come over to this side of the park, we really have to balance our resource management with the park visitation. And one of those things that we've done to try to help with that balance is closing the drive to visitation on Wednesdays. So with that, we're trying to focus all of the work that we could have been doing all week until one day um, when we don't have the impact of visitation on this road at that time. There was a number of parks that were being looked at and actually in all parts of the state, uh, except for the Northeast part. Um, a number of places were looked at that were in the historic range of bison. Um, ultimately, after uh, a large set of criteria, Miniopa was chosen because it did have native and remnant prairie here that, that needed a management effort put into it. But the, the big component for this was that it allowed people to get up close and personal with the bison, with the road going through the middle of the bison range. The other herd that we have in Minnesota at Blue Mounds has a 500 acre uh, enclosure um, that has a trail that goes around the outside of it. And at times, uh, visitors get a, a real good look at the bison there, but there was a much better opportunity here. So it was chosen simply because it gave our visitors a different experience than what's provided at Blue Mounds. There was a lot that went into getting bison on site. So what we, where we're standing right now um, was nothing but a road with some hiking trails going through it. So the logistics were one, fencing in the 330 acre enclosure for the bison, which Miniopa does not have a lot of topsoil at it. Um, so a lot of the fence posts here were drilled into, into bedrock. And um, so that was, that was a large process to get them here. Um, there was a lot of work that went into um, evaluating uh, both bison safety as well as visitor safety at this location, making sure that our visitors are safe. But um, a, lot of, a lot of it was making sure the bison were safe too. Um, and then once that was done, then uh, the start of the Miniopa herd was eight bison were taken from Blue Mound State Park and three bison were taken from the Minnesota Zoo for 11 total brought together here in 2015 and released into Miniopa uh, for the first time in, in many, many years that bison were back on, onto this landscape. And since the bison arrival, it's, it's been a learning experience both understanding the bison's behavior in this landscape compared to other landscapes, understanding our visitors' behavior, and uh, trying to make the two coincide as well as we can for experience and safety. And uh, we'll never stop learning how to manage the two. Um, and that's not even managing the prairie at the same time. I've grown up in Mankato, so I've lived here 70 years, and I've actually got a photo of my mother holding me when I was less than one year old by the waterfall. And so uh, 
I know this park really well in terms of natural history and human history. And essentially every square foot at Minneopolis State Park has layers of history to it. So there's just a lot to know. So when the bison arrived in September of 2015, I was fortunate enough to be one of the people who was here to see that happen. And before that happened, I actually did a little bit of research on the history of bison in Blue Earth County. And so in 1851, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux was signed in St. Peter. That opened up this whole Minnesota River Valley to European settlers to come in. At that time, the bison were already out of here. And even when Joseph Nicolay came in the 1830s, he did not see bison herds. So they estimate the last bison herd that would have been here would have been in the mid 1820s. And so with that in mind, 200 years since the last bison hit the ground here, it was kind of an emotional moment to see that come out of the trailer and hit the ground. The question is, have, have the bison changed the prairie? And I think it's too early to really tell that. There are a few wallows where they get on their backs and roll around. That's one of the things that bison do to change the prairie because bison are a keystone piece to a real true prairie. Uh, I think most of the changes that we've seen are changes that uh, the park people have made, like cutting down trees, doing prescribed burns and removing invasive species. There, there are more visitors. Before the bison came, we were almost told this park might be closed down. Um, like any park that gets a lot of use, some of it is becoming abused. But I think people are enjoying the out of doors. There are so many more people here than ever used to be. So since I can come during the week, I come in the week during the week and let the other people have it during the weekend. And that's, that's good. Um, I think the public um, wants to know more about it. And without volunteers like me up here to explain things to them, they leave the park with not a full appreciation of what these bison are. Not only are they the largest mammal in North America, and it's our, our national mammal and all the history that goes with it, uh, I just don't think they would have as good appreciation of that. Really, my job is to educate the public about not only what the bison are as animals, but what they're doing with this prairie and why they're here. And that goal of creating you know, a 500 animal herd um, throughout the state and really to put a spotlight that you can't have bison without prairie and you really can't have a true prairie without bison. I think if we are truly going to have more prairie and if we're truly going to get people excited about prairie, one of the ways that we can do that is by having bison because it doesn't matter if you're five or 85. When you see that animal, you get excited. I've done tours with older people that say, yeah, we've seen bison here, we've seen bison there. We're on the bus, we're driving through. We see the bison, everybody stands up. I've seen them a hundred times. It doesn't matter. It's just this whole experience. And so I think Prairie suffers so much and it continues to suffer. And we really need every, lack for a better word, tools in our box to be able to promote that and get people to excited about it. I'm not saying that bison always have to be part of that equation, but it can be a, a, a good part of that equation. I was not thinking at all about what does bringing bison back to Minneopa State Park, to Mankato with the history of the town of Mankato. I did not think or realize what a healing piece that would be. I was thinking like, oh, Prairie is missing a grazer. We need bison back. You know, I was just thinking of all the, the biology pieces, but like 
it just took me by surprise. And so I guess that was a lesson for me is like to in, have that community involvement. And I think that's why this project has been so successful. Like the community of Mankato has just absolutely adopted these bison as their own. And so it's pretty cool. The opportunities is that we're introducing a landscape that has literally disappeared off the map. You think about, what is it, 18 million acres of prairie at one time here in Minnesota, and we have less than 1%. And you hear people who never gave prairie a chance or never thought about prairie until all of a sudden they come here and they see this open uh, horizon and then the colors and not only the colors in the spring, but the colors that move all the way through the fall. And suddenly people are getting excited. If they can understand that one part affects the other parts, I suppose you would call the bison the cornerstone animal in this park or in this area. And it does make a difference. Um, and I do like the flowers, <laughs> so, but, it's always, I, I think we are so cut off from nature anymore that we don't see what is really happening around us. And it makes a difference. It's important for us to understand our place in this world. And in a time when there seems to be less and less respect and concern for the natural elements around us, the prairie, the plains, the, the forests, the rivers. Um, coming to a space like this where we can see a natural prairie, where we can see bison in their natural habitat is a perfect example of what we can accomplish if we decide that we want to save something. What we miss when we cannot stand on the earth, we lose what makes us human. Because when we're disconnected from our land, when we're disconnected from the earth that supports us, we lose something here. And that connection between the heart and the head is really important when we make decisions. So to come to this place and to be able to stand in this beauty, in this breeze, in under the stars, um, helps us reinforce that we are part of this system, not the owners of it. All right, I was just giving it a little beat of space there because Gwen is so good with how she phrases things. So I wanted to make sure we all had a had a moment to take it all in. So just like we did before, we're going to have the panel participants go ahead and turn on your video so that you're real, you're real people and everybody can see you. Um, and then we're just going to ask questions about this module, all the questions that you might have about bison, bringing them back, um, the logistics. Uh, have you ever had to run from such a large and wild animal? Because yes, they are wild animals. And what we'll do while everybody's thinking about what they want to ask is, um, Oh, sorry, we're going to use Padlet again, but if Padlet's not working for you, if it's just like, oh, I can't make it happen, just unmute or type in the chat and we will fix it. So what we'll go ahead and do is we're going to start with JB's question from last time. Um, and then a couple of these questions that are related to herd size while people get their their new questions populated in, if that sounds OK. All right, hearing no objections. So free range. Do the bisons have free roam? Um, do you move them around? Oh, JP, I didn't even give you the chance to give voice to your question. Do you want to give voice to your question? 
Well, I typed it right away and uh, it basically got answered. So, um, I mean, they have 300 and some acres. There's about a, a herd of 30 with one bull. And occasionally you guys do some patch burn grazing. So, uh, and then you, you, you do the exclusion fencing to keep them from beating up some uh, sedge meadows and whatnot. So. Yeah, JB, I can add to that, that when we first started with that smaller herd size, you know, with eight animals and then it kind of, they had some calves, so it was 20 and um, our herd was too small for the patch sizes we were using. We were burning anywhere between 40 and 100 acre just because those were what our burn units had been and that's where our trails were. Um, and we realized that some of those patches were too big for them to stay on because, you know, the concept of patch burn grazing is they're going to hit that new growth. But then if the grass starts growing faster than they can graze, it's going to get bigger and then they're just going to move somewhere else. But if they can keep on it and keep it short and lush, then they'll stay on it longer. So we were seeing that our, our sizes were too, um, our burn units were too big. So I worked with Kelly Anderson and we redid our grazing plan. And now we're looking at about 10% of the of the range being burned each year. So do you know do you know um how many AUMs per acre over the season um you're you're grazing? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold, so my throat is scratchy. Um you know, I can send you the burn plan if or the grazing plan if you want to look at it. We just did um, redo it, and we're about at a, about 26 to 28 animal units since we grazed them all year round. Um, but it's about 26 animal units, yeah. Okay. Okay, I apologize. Juggling, juggling on my screens. Doki, um, herd size management. Does the person who asked this question want to give voice to it? This one right here. Could have been so long ago, you might have forgot. I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Uh, what happens to the bison that are called from the herd? And Craig or Ashley, if you want to start. We talked about the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd and how we work together to try to grow the herd. So one of the things that we look at is when new partners come into the system, we will share animals to help establish new herds and new locations. Um, for instance, we, we made reference to Dakota County. Um, they did receive two cow-calf pairs from Miniopa, as well as two yearling females to start their herd. They also received two two-year-old females from Blue Mounds, and they, well, they only received one yearling from Miniopa, they received another yearling from Oxbow State Park. So we share within the system to help establish those new herds. Um, with that, we will sometimes have excess animals. So um, some of those yearling bull calves that are born, things like that, that don't really play an important role in expanding the genetics and increasing the diversity within the herd itself, they will be selected for to be auctioned off. So we do partner with Blue Mountain State Park where excess animals will be auctioned together um, as one auction annually. All right, we're gonna continue with this, with this theme here. So what is this, oh, Christine. Do you want to give voice to your question? This one right here about smallest herd of prairie. Sure thing. Um, yeah. What is the smallest herd and area of prairie you would recommend trying to implement uh, bison grazing? We don't have many areas in Hennepin that are, you know, 300 acres in size to try um, either cattle or bison management, but um, some that are, you know, just over 100 and I'm curious kind of what yeah what are the smaller smaller ends of the spectrum in terms of herds and areas that you would recommend trying this i would say one option for a smaller area 
you could um, just graze bison during part of the season and usually people will use like yearlings or younger animals because they're a little easier to move. Um, I think the Bellwin Conservancy does that where they work with a um, private grazer and just bring bison in during the summer and graze it. That way you don't have to have the handling facility and all the other um, things because your cost is going to be the handling facility is going to be in the fencing. And so, you know, if you had several hundred acres in different locations, you wouldn't want to put a handling facility in each of those. So maybe you could just graze during the summer and then take the bison out. With us, since they're there year round, we auction them and work them once a year. We have a permanent handling facility. So it's really um, how many animals is it worth spending all that money on that expensive, you know, infrastructure? So I would say 300 acres would be the smallest. I would probably go if you were going to do all the infrastructure with the handling facility and the wells and the, you know, the fencing and everything, um, just because you're not going to get a ton of animals out there otherwise. Um, I don't know, Craig, Ashley, do you have any thoughts on it? We did have a discussion around, like, how big is a herd and what do people expect to see? You know, is 10 animals enough? Is that a herd? And and we kind of came around the number like we want at least 20 because that looks like a herd to visitors. So, um, yeah. Oh, I think you I think you answered it, Molly. It is I was gonna mention just how how expensive it really is. And that's something Dakota County. Um that's what they really looked at was cost wise, was it they went back and forth between having their own resident herd or <clears throat> or bringing um, bison to their landscape just on a seasonal basis from producers and ultimately they ended up having their their own herd with their own infrastructure but that is that is definitely a cost benefit analysis that needs to be done. I'm going to pivot as Ross Geller would say. Uh, Gwen Tell me a little bit about what it means to have the bison return essentially to this landscape to you as a Dakota person. It's a restoration of hope, of hope for the future. Um, in terms of a recognition of the origins of this place. <clears throat> and I think a lot of times um, local or regional indigenous groups are left out of the process when um, projects like this one, the bison restoration herd, um, are conceived and implemented. So that I think is important in helping restore good working relationships between Dakota communities, Dakota people, and um, the other entities within Dakota Makoche or Dakota Homeland. So on a broader scale, that's that's what it means um, to me. It's just um, it's it's here. It goes really deep, and I don't really know how to explain it except that it seems so such a natural part of who who I am where I've been um, and um, to be Dakota in this place. And you told us a funny story when we were out there on site. I know I'm putting you on the spot. Well, you told us a lot of funny stories. But the one I want to ask narrow you about. Down. Yeah, narrow it down. <laughs> so um, Scott and, and the park staff for a lot of reasons, you know, caution against naming 
the bison because the DNR does have to make management decisions. And when you look at um, just this different way of looking at animal husbandry or management, you you know, you don't want to get too attached. But from a Dakota perspective, it's very different. You are attached and connected to these bison. And so you told us a story about um, naming the bison. I don't know if you remember the one I'm talking about. Yes, yes. Um, the first cow out of the trailer in that first group, um, it was obvious once everybody else was out that she was the lead, um, the lead cow. And because she was first, we called her Winuna. And that means firstborn girl in, in Dakota family um, structure. So we called her Winuna and Scott was like, no, we don't name the buffalo. We don't, oh, he didn't say that. He said, we don't name the bison. <laughs> and, and we still called her Winuna. Um, and then um, we were there when the, I still call him the little bull. He's, he's not little anymore, but when the little bull came, um, he came out of the trailer and Winuna went right to him, nose to nose, to let him know what was going on. And then there was another cow that came behind and she was the dom she's the dominant um, female. So when we came out to, to record for this program, all of a sudden everybody had names. The dominant female is Sally. No, Lucy. Lucy. And I assume that's Charlie Brown and Lucy. Um, and then the bull is Teddy because he came from Theodore Roosevelt National Park. But um, yeah, not official names, but that's what we call them. Well, and I think it's really powerful and interesting too to just shift per perspective and think, well, I. I am connected. This is my relative. And so it does have a name, right? Whereas um, maybe from a different perspective of management, it's like, no, we don't we don't want people to get too, too attached to them. So it's just an interesting juxtaposition that I want to carry forward here as we think about how we are connected to this, to Mediopa, but also to the prairie world in general. Okay, I'm going to shift a little bit. Uh, Brianna gave me permission to read this question, so I'm going to read it. Do um, Does having the bison contribute to the increase in any invasive species? And flip side, do they keep any invasive species in check? Molly, I'll, this seems like a resource management question, so we'll start with you. Sorry. My mouse is at working today, so it won't let me unmute easily. Um, OK, so I'll start with we had quite a few invasives out there um, to begin with. It was grazed um, pretty heavily in, you know, the the history of the park, that side of the park. So we had crown vetch, we had a lot of mullein, um, reed canary grass, and then buckthorn was coming in the woody areas. Um, so that's kind of what we started with is like this system that was already pretty heavily impacted but had really nice areas of prairie in it. So I would not say that the bison have helped um, keep any of the invasives at bay other than they do like to eat cool season grass. Um, so they do eat the brome and stuff and then I think that does allow some of our low growing forbs to get a chance at sunlight. So um, but we haven't really seen like a huge spread of anything. I was worried that because we have parsnip coming in from the highway, um, and it keeps reinfesting, I was worried they'd be spreading that quite a bit, but I don't think that they're spreading it any more than the birds and the white-tailed deer are, are already doing. So, um, you know, their wallows will get weedy, but it's usually some annual weeds like ragweeds and just some short stuff around the edges um, and it actually creates more diversity out there so I'm usually not worried about that um, but I do think um, 
you know, if you're going to use them as a way to manage invasive species, there's much easier ways to do that, like goats or something. Um, but uh, they aren't really spreading. The only the only one I think they're increasing is um, maybe reed canary grass in the areas where they, because they like sedges just so preferentially. If you let them eat all the sedges out, what are you going to get come up? Probably reed canary grass. So um, that's one area that we've had to be really careful is keeping them out of the nice sedge meadows for for too long or, you know, we don't want that to convert all the reed canary grass. So um, that's kind of a roundabout answer to that question, but. Well, you led right into the next question I wanted to ask, <laughs> which is um, somebody asked a question about goats. Do you want to give voice to your question about browsers? Yeah. Um, so we do not use goats at any of the parks that we have bison because of um, disease management. So we follow all the disease protocol that the Minnesota Zoo follows and they're pretty stringent. So we don't want any other animals of any kind near our bison herd. And that was one of the factors we looked at when Minneopo was chosen on if there were any cattle herds or sheep or anything around there because we want to try to keep our herd isolated and not bring any new diseases in. And that also means when we bring any animals in, they're quarantined, tested um, before we would bring anything in. So goats would never come into Miniopa on the range side because of that reason. Now we do use goats at Flandro for buckthorn control and we're liking the results on that. That's a whole nother talk I can give another day, but, um, but yeah, so for that reason, we won't use goats at Miniopa. Emily, I just have a follow up clarifying question. So that contamination aspect, if you will, is really only for a, a grazing animal. Like we're not regulating deer that come in. Well, I guess right. they are grazing animal. Too. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm trying to make a distinction between a managed, a more managed herd versus um, animals that can leave the park freely. Yeah, it's more that domestic. Um, cattle and livestock that we're worried about. Um, cattle carry Yone's disease, which we always test for. Um, sheep carry some pneumonias and things that can impact bison. And we do vaccinate um, for one or two of those um, to, to kind of control that. But uh, it's mostly the domestic herds we're worried about. Invasive prunus. Does the person who asked that question, I said it so cheerfully, but did the person who asked that question want to give voice to it? I think the participants are learning that I only count to 10 in my head and then I just read it. It's like a cheat that I'm offering you. <laughs> Where if you really don't want to talk, I will talk for you. Um, okay, so this person asked, and if there's any other context that I'm missing here, please feel free to um, un turn your mic on and, and give voice to it. But so they're interested to hear is it about the prunus a little bit more. We talked in the video about how many people, Scott, um, Molly, I think both mentioned how much plum there is. Um, you know, is this considered a good prairie species or I, they phrase it as positive element, positive shrub element in prairies. Yeah, so invasive probably is not the correct term for this because it is native. I'd say it's aggressive out there and we've we've been seeing it increase over the years. And so the goal is not to get rid of the plum out there because it is a really important pollinator plant and does get used quite a bit by wildlife out there. Um, but to just kind of keep the areas restricted on where it can spread into. Um, so, you know, we'll do forestry mowing around edges or um, mow a whole patch down, but not necessarily spray it so that it can just, it can come back, but we're just kind of, kind of keeping it in check more than anything. Craig, I don't know if you have anything to add or Ashley to that, but um for the plums, it's just more of a, not a total eradication, but just a um, control. OK, 
Craig, you're also following my motto where you're watching me count to 10 and then you're like, nope, not going to say anything. Nope, Molly's right. I had nothing to add. I like I that. Molly's right. <laughs> Molly's right. Nothing to add. It's also recorded just for everybody who's wondering. So Molly, you Bye. could just take that clip <laughs> and make it your new ringtone for Craig. <laughs> just saying, you have options. <laughs> okay, we're gonna pivot to this question. Becky, would you like to ask this about being the model for future reintroductions? Sure, so as the DNR is working towards the 500 bison, um, across the state um, at different locations is this story of Miniopa bison reintroduction going to be used as the model moving forward to meet that goal and then I'm just interested to hear from a couple of you on maybe some of the greatest lessons learned or messages that can be used moving forward um both working with the tribe or anything different with you know that you learn logistically I, I guess i'll leave it open for for your answers thanks i was going to start with the park managers for this one so ashley i know you like to be put on the spot but let's let's start with you um, I would say that one of the things that we are implementing that we've learned, you know, here at Miniopa is that the design for your handling facility can make a really big difference on how well your management events go. Um, one of the things, and and I will let Molly talk more about this, she does our humane animal audits um, during our management day. And one of the things that has been noticed is that our facility results in a lot less stress on the animals um, while they work through the corral system and we do our management days. So um, that is something that we're looking at trying to implement in other locations. And really, I think, I mean, I should really let Craig talk more because he was really instrumental in developing the fence and things like that. But he talked about some of the things um, that we learned from that. But beyond that, it's it's, really how do you manage the people and the bison to ensure both are safe and we did talk about putting in that electric fence to bring some distance from the entrance and where the public was able to i mean really they'd park along there and they would walk right up to the fence and because it was a favorite location of the bison we had concerns about the safety of both the bison and the visitors so by creating that distance it increased safety for both and you know, we're never going to figure out the solution to keeping people in their cars, but it's it is something to consider. Is you know, as people are going through, we can't be there every second of the day that the range is open, and you know, we have not had any incidents occur. However, we do think about how do we better communicate with the public about the importance of staying inside their vehicle. Um, one thing that I think we've really learned is the importance of the bison ambassadors and what they offer to the visitors of this park. I have heard from so many visitors that they'd been here before, they didn't know the bison ambassadors were there, and when they came and found them, how much more they took away from their visit here and how meaningful it was to them to have someone to talk about the bison and answer their questions and help them get a closer view of them. Oftentimes our bison ambassadors have a spotting scope up there, which helps people get those really nice close views that they may not have otherwise gotten from the road because a lot of folks don't think about bringing binoculars when they come. So it's a way to really make that connection and help to teach them about how important the prairie really is in Minnesota. And one of the other features is is the interpretive signage. Um, it's not really part of the bison, but one of my favorite pieces that we have for interpretive signage, it shows how much of the state was once prairie. When people think of Minnesota, they don't think of prairie. So by bringing the bison, it's helping people reconnect to what the state really did look like prior to European settlement and how much of it really was prairie and helping them 
to again see the importance of prairie for pollinators and the landscape and and really just connect with nature. Nicely put. Before um, we pivot to Craig, just in case he has some more things to add, could you describe a little bit the management day? Because um, people might not be familiar with what that's for or what that is. So once a year, we will have a management day at Miniopa State Park. Um, all of the facilities that have bison generally will have some kind of a management day. It's it's a day where we will bring them all together. Um, Craig had talked about our paddocks and some of them having to be beefed up so that when they were in being held that we could keep them in one location. Um, so we have, it's a green corral system. People see it when they, they come in. Oftentimes we'll ask um, about about what that is for. Um, and so we will put them into the pens and we will push them through that corral system. Um, when we talk about humane handling, um, bison are not like cattle. You don't hoop and holler and yell and push them. Really, we're doing flags, we're quiet. Um, we're, we're just pushing them through in a very soft and humane way in a way that they move naturally and minimizes their stress. As they get to the end, there is a, a it's a, it's a squeeze um, where the animal can be immobilized without any product or any tranquilization. And it, it's just meant to hold it safely so that our staff and our veterinarian can work with them. So if they need any um, vaccinations or anything like that, they will take place at that time. Um, we weigh them and make sure that everybody is doing okay. So we get a weight on them. And when they go through there, we that's when we make our decision. So we usually have a plan on how many animals we're going to retain over the winter months. So our event takes place in October and we make decisions at that time as to which animals are being either relocated to another facility those that may be going to auction or those that are being released back out into the prairie to stay at Miniopa another year. So any of our calves that were born that year, they're going to stay with their mothers. They stay, um, you know, until they're about that 18 months. So they typically will go as a yearling when they're about 18 months old, or they'll go when they're two years old. And what it is, it's, it's really us making sure that we are not having inbreeding occurring within our herd. And again, that we are enhancing the genetics rather than degrading them through inbreeding. I don't have a lot to add outside of what uh, Ashley said. Um, the handling facility was probably, not probably, was my favorite project that I've ever worked on for the DNR. Um, that was learning what we knew about the facility at Blue Mounds, what we didn't like about that facility, visiting other facilities and seeing what worked, what didn't work. Um, we collaborated as a group. We used Temple Grandin's book, Humane Livestock Handling, and we put everything together to come up with the facility. And I think we've got we've got a really good facility in terms of how, how the bison enter it, how they move through it, and how they're released back to the bison range. Um, we could have done better probably on the, the adult holding pens. Um, but you learn something. So anybody that's that's starting down this road, um, the best thing that you can do is visit as many facilities as you can while the bison are actually being worked in those facilities. Because it's hard to picture that if you just visit on a day that there's no bison there. Um, so that's something I would recommend. And then the other thing that I learned is do not underestimate the impact to all of the rest of your facilities outside of bison, roads, parking lots, restrooms, um, if you have a campground, if you have any sort of visitor facilities, because they're going to increase, um, just they're just going to increase amazing numbers when the bison arrive. And so that's something to to really take into account when you're planning, when you're budgeting is your impacts on the rest of your infrastructure. Craig, can you put the uh, link to that book in the chat? Temple Granite's book that you just mentioned. Sure. I like be, I like being the host because I just tell you guys to do stuff. And you just do it. It's nice. <laughs> okay, we're gonna give the <laughs> three of you a little break. Scott Kadelka, we're gonna pivot to you and ask this question from Tom Skilling. 
um, which is sort of a loaded question, but again, we know that you can handle it. Um, Tom, do you want to give voice to this question? Sure. Uh, I was just wondering what kind of training, if, if any, did the managers take before the bison were reintroduced, you know, and kind of as it relates to management plans or public use and visitation? Oh, you're asking a different one. Sorry, I wanted you to ask this one. <laughs> <laughs> Does the public support the park and the management that is occurring? You could uh, answer both. Scott, if you want to, but then start with questions. this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll skip the training of the managers and let them handle that one. Um, I, I guess it just goes back. Yeah, I think um, we have been, or Minneopa has been fortunate that um, as one of the first state parks established, um, really it was small, you know, less than 30 acres. Sorry, I have a cat on my lap. So every now and then you're going to see this pop up. Um, I, I think that really has driven that community sport uh, for the project. And, uh, you know, we've been really fortunate to have a great group as the Bison Ambassadors, but I also have to give a heads up to Tim Pulis, who you saw in the video. Um, right off, I recognized what a great role he could be. Um, as a lead bison ambassador, and he really has taken on that role. Um, when it comes to volunteers, it's not you just get a bunch of volunteers and you throw them out there. It takes a lot of time and effort for training, but um, that for me and the other park staff has uh, really helped because of Tim Pulis. And so I think Minneopa has just been fortunate that the community has been very supportive of the park and now with the bison herd. I was trying to find my picture in the background um, that you all saw in the video of the dog wearing the bison buddy hat, which I think is particularly good. <laughs> so I was trying to pull it up on the screen, but it's in a different cache of photos. Okay, it is 11 o'clock, no one panic. Uh, we're just gonna move through these last questions for the last 30 minutes here. Um, and then we will do, well, somewhere around 1125, we'll do a quick wrap up and talk about what you're going to learn about tomorrow, which is a lot of more exciting things as well. There's just so much to talk about with Miniopa. Okay, Mike, do you want to give voice to this question? I think it's a, a really interesting idea here. This bison. Yeah, world. sure. <laughs> yep, sure. Mike Molling, a biologist from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service at Min Valley. In Carver, Minnesota. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges, of course, with trying to manage bison is not, you know, you have to have obviously a large land base to work on. And one of the challenges, too, is that no, not, not every land base has that capacity to add bison, nor do they have the management um, operations to handle bison. So my question was basically, has anyone ever tried to replicate wallows without bison? Um, we know how important the, it, the magical practice, practice is, of course, to maintain heterogeneity and also create ephemeral pools. But has anybody ever looked at artificial types of wallows and trying to maintain those throughout uh, maybe a planted prairie more so than a, a native remnant? I am not aware of any research that's done that. I'd be interested if anyone else um put it in the chat if you're aware of any research. Um, I'd love to get some research from Miniopa around the wallows because we are seeing some interesting things there. Um, for example, I was out there during the summer on a pretty active wallow and there were just bees like surrounding it because I don't even remember what the plant was, but it was just like an annual weedy plant that was blooming, but it just created this little pocket of you know, blooming plants and the bees were just covered in it. And, um, you know, it was obviously creating a little patch for them. And so I think it would be really interesting to to look into that and to play around with that because you are creating and also, you know, bare ground. Some species need some bare ground for nesting and things like that. So um, I'd love to know more about this. So if anyone knows any research, put it in the chat because that's a really cool question. Can you can you talk a little bit along those lines about 
frequency of wallows. I know there's there's obviously there's relic wallows and there's new wallows. Can you tell a little bit about the dynamics of the frequency of a of what would be a, a typical wallow? So if we start looking at management types of practices and duration, what would we normally see? I know it depends on the site conditions, et cetera, but yes. and is there impact on urine and fur and hair and everything in these wallows that you're aware of? Yeah, you know, that's a good one. Kind of also with that is we have a lot of um, burrowing animals out there. So I do see like where an animal will burrow and create some ground disturbance and then the bison mm -hmm. will use that and kind of open it up more. Uh, Craig and Ashley, do you notice that as well? I I can't say that like how, how many wallows are created per acre or anything. I We've just never really measured it. Um, I don't know. Do you know, Craig? There definitely are some I, areas where they're getting something out of the soil. Um, and I mean, there's times where the bull will just go just decimate a little area just for, because he's in a bad mood or something. So um, mm -hmm. they can create them pretty quickly. And and But then they have their permanent ones that they kind of more come back to all the time. So um. yeah, there is. There's permanent ones that the second year after the bison were there, we looked at building observation towers um, for people to view them at what they had established as their favorite favorite wallowing sites and favorite loafing sites. But um, we held off on that, and it was it was a good thing that we did because they moved away from those favorites. So something changes that that they decide they don't don't like those locations and a different location provides provides something that they're lacking or something that they're looking for and it has nothing to do with the the pressure of the public of the viewers because i i think their very favorite loafing and wallowing spot still remains right at the entrance to the bison range and it's it's like they have this uh there's something it's got to be something in the soil there because it, it looks like a, a grazed down lawn, but they they love that area or maybe it's just a uh, kind of a, a desire for some some fame because they always make themselves available that day um, when they're up there. And it doesn't matter that that's where they receive the most pressure from people too. they they will hold their ground and stay in that location. Uh, one final comment, please, and thanks for the info. Um, if there are any uh, of your maintenance folks that want to talk further about this, have them hit me up, please. Um, email me or text me or whatever. I have talked about a few folks about some type of machinery that might be able to replicate this. And so trying to get a, gain a better understanding of, you know, what what the frequency duration would be, et cetera, to make this uh, to truly uh, beneficial to our planet prairie. Thanks, folks. Yeah, I think that's a super neat line of question. I was just trying to bring up the video in the background. Hopefully it wasn't playing sound because my intention was that when I shared it, it wasn't. Okay, I'm doing good. <laughs> like so, so that you could just see them in their wallows. And as far as like equipment and machinery, I mean, I know prairie grass is quite difficult to get through, but I think with enough tenacity, you maybe could use a rake and make a wallow. Like with the with enough um perseverance you could do it because they're only as big as a well i don't know how big all of them are and craig and molly and ashley and gwen and scott would know more but like if you look at this wallow right here it's about the size of this bison right because he's rolling as she is rolling to the left and right so i don't know yeah. it seems so like Megan, I was, it be that, that's a good point megan thank you for that I think one of the things that, that I've been noticed is that the compaction plays a major role mm -hmm. and the frequency or duration of the ephemeral nature of the pond too. So we're also thinking about shorebird use and, and you know, of course, herbs using these these areas. So extending the duration of the ephemeral pond also beyond raking is something that we couldn't do without some type of compaction machine. Absolutely. Yep. You're not that's wrong. A, that's a really good point. Um, I wanted to mention so we had what we call watering holes now. I have a picture of one of them with ducks on it. It was holding water in the 90s, but none of us have seen it hold water again. And that's 
yeah, Megan, if you put that map back up, it's right along the road and the road kind of goes through this wetland. Um, and so it's kind of up towards the west end of the range. Um, so it wasn't holding water. None of us since we'd been with the DNR had seen it hold water, but I had pictures of it holding water. Um, and remember the site was grazed by cattle in the 70s um, before it became a park. So it did have that history. And then we got a lot of rain and it started holding water. And then once the bison came in, I think they compacted it and now it holds water with very little rain. Um, and it was holding water almost year round during our, our wetter season. So, or during a wetter year. So I think that it was lacking that compaction and, and that's why it's had started draining before. And now it's functioning as a wetland that's holding water again, now that the hoof action is in there. And, and it's one of my favorite spots to look for birds because it's a good little spot for that. So. Like it, we're on a wallow tangent, but it's a good tangent. So <laughs> um, let's shift gears a little bit to Craig, um, your question that you asked here, which I also like how you worded it. Craig's having some technical difficulties, but here he is. Here he is. You mean, mean the uh, question about expectations? Or... Are the bison doing what they're supposed to do? Yeah, so this, this group is definitely obviously students of bison and, and did your homework um, and lots of research before implementing this. Uh, you mentioned like the success of the bison handling facilities and how you know, you'd know you encourage people to check those out uh, in action. But um, we we're also curious about other uh, maybe things that were surprising, uh, despite the amount of effort, you know, once once you got them out of this unique spot, what have you learned that you wouldn't have uh, imagined before you got them there? I can what? talk about the grazing side of it. Um, they and I had been told, you know, they'll form grazing lawns, but they really do just have their favorite areas. And like, for example, like prairie drop seed is like candy to them. So you can't find a prairie drop seed out in that range that hasn't been grazed. So like in my mind, I'd like to, <laughs> to have more prairie drop seed out there, but you know, they love it. So, um, so they're mostly doing like, there were some surprises, like they weren't touching the little blue stem. Um, so just some of those little peculiarities, I guess, surprised me. Uh, but overall, I'd say, yeah, they're doing what they what we thought they would do. Um, I'd say the biggest challenge has been they're having too many babies too quickly. So they're a little too healthy and happy out there. And um, we had kind of a record year for babies last year and then a drought. Uh, so now we're trying to back off on that number. Um, because they are out there doing what they do, and we just want to make sure we don't have too many of them um, on that 330 acres. So, anyone Gwen, else, wanna, Craig or Ashley? Gwen, I'm going to pass it to you. Actually, is anything different than what you expected with the bison returning to Miniopa? I think they're doing what they're supposed to do yes it's um they've brought more visitors to the park they've brought more recognition to our ecosystem and the importance of bison um and i think they've maybe this wasn't in the plan but i think they've also helped develop really good working relationships among all of the groups that are invested in seeing that the bison do well well, and one of the things that your husband taught me, actually, is that he's also a teacher at Minnesota State, and he often recommends for his students to go to the park to see the bison and to see the land because the land is telling you things all the time. And so it just brought home to me that, you know, we think of teaching 
and some sometimes we think of teaching right as like using our powerpoints and our computers and all of these things but glenn just so nicely explained to us that really they could just go out and we're learning more about how these connections work just by being out there at the park and seeing what's happening on the land so he's a good teacher uh craig or ashley anything that you were surprised by or didn't expect or i was coming from blue mounds blue mounds is a wide open uh grassland landscape no shade at all um so when the bison came to miniopa who which has plum thickets uh oak savannas low and burr oaks i thought that the bison would take advantage of um of some of those features that they don't have access to at blue mounds in terms of shade during the hot summer or um getting out of the wind during the winter or um insect relief and they they just absolutely don't do that it doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees and humid uh they they won't seek shade they just lay in the open and um in the winter if low temperatures and in in howling winds they don't go into a plum thicket to avoid the the wind or the wind chill they lay in the open with their their head facing into the wind so it's not blowing up into their fur and um just amazed me how that they're they're just built for the elements and they don't need the shade of that oak tree and um so it was that that amazed me and because there wasn't a whole lot of woody stems or cover at blue mounds it surprised me during the winter and even during the summer at miniopa the amount of grazing um the amount of grazing that bison will do uh, through sumac patches or through little um, dogwood patches or or little little oak trees, the amount that they'll nip at buds or branches or leaves as they push through those things. So they're um, they almost in that sense they almost resemble deer more by how they're how they're foraging than they do the grazing activity of bison. Um, so those are two things that kind of jumped out at me. I had noticed some of the same things that Craig just mentioned. I, I was really surprised by their lack of need for shade. Um, you know, we talk about how they're not cattle. Cattle actively seek shade and the bison do not. Um, and again, the browsing at the, the buds for sumac, that was really surprising for me as well. That wasn't something I was expecting. Um, but outside of just the bison themselves and, and what they're doing, Megan kind of touched on it a little bit, but I was really surprised by the partnerships that it created within the community with our local universities, how much more they utilize this park as part of their educational plans and to provide real world experiences for their students. Um, you know, the biology class, they come out and, and have a class based on animal observation and um, the recreation parks and leisures program, they come out and utilize it quite a bit. So just even the value that they've brought to young adults coming up and coming into this field and how much they can learn just really in their backyard and how eager those the faculty were to help create those relationships and provide those opportunities has been really exciting. I'm curious um, and tell me if you don't want to answer this question, which is fine. It's just a question that's in my mind right now. Um, you know, at some national parks and other maybe larger parks, we hear sometimes about tribal hunts being authorized because of the connection um, that they have to bison and because of the role it plays in their culture. And I'm just wondering if there's ever been any talk or thought or consideration about that um, and what that might look like. And if you don't answer it, just, you know, hold up a hand, like two fingers. That's like, nope. <laughs> just, Gwen, we can start with you if you think that would even be something that's um, an interesting avenue to pursue or not pursue. I don't know. <clears throat> 
That takes a lot of skill. I don't know what that means in a small place like Miniopa. It's not like they're going to come out on horseback and chase these guys down. And um, so so I, I, I don't know. I don't have enough experience with that. Um, and, you know, it's such a small place. Custer National Park, I think, is one of the places that does that and maybe Yellowstone. Um, and those are big, big places. So, got me. I can speak a little bit to it, Megan. Um, I think the idea of, because they're not truly wild, we call them kind of semi-wild, they are habituated to humans and cars. Um, the idea of a fair chase hunt probably would not exist at Miniopa, so it wouldn't be you know, a true hunting experience. Um, it would, you know, you'd have to think of it more as a harvest that you're going in and harvesting that animal for meat. It's not truly a hunt. So I think there would be a lot of controversy there. So we've never really gone down that road. But when we do have animals that like um, we're bringing in and they don't pass quarantine, we have um, made that animal available for meat um, for different communities um, and done things in that respect. Uh, so it wouldn't be, you know, more of that out there in the field, but more as providing that um, that meat and that resource uh, that was there historically. So. No, oh, it's a fair point. I wondered too, because of the size, because Gwen, you hit on it right away. These other places, they are much larger. And Molly, I think you had a good context to that about that these bison in some ways are habituated to people so that we can maintain safety as people are driving through the drive and everything. And they're used to that happening and people being I mean, sometimes they're standing in the road and lick your car. So, I mean, they're awfully <laughs> close to your car, right? Like, so we want, we want them, that to be an okay experience for the people and the bison. Um, it is always entertaining <laughs> when you're getting a bison car wash. I want to pivot a little bit to winter grazing. Uh, Brandon, do you want to give voice to this? Yeah, sorry. So, um turn on my video too. Um, so yeah, just curious with cattle grazing, we're often just grazing in the summer months, but obviously with with bison, it's a year round thing. Have you noticed any um, kind of implications from that for plant communities, animal communities, um, or just anything in general? Well, I will say about bison is um, they use their heads like a snowplow, um, so they will access those grasses even if there's quite a bit of snow out there. Um, at Miniopa and at Blue Mounds, we provide uh, prairie hay for them in the winter, and that goes back to my quote about um, happy bison don't test fences. Um, Nutritionally, uh, we wrote the grazing plan so that they wouldn't need to be supplementally fed at any time of the year, um, but we don't want them roaming, which is their natural tendency to do in the winter, is to go search for food. Um, so we we have an area in each of the parks that we set aside just for haying, and we do 800-pound um, round bales um, during the winter just to keep them kind of on the happy side. So. Um, so yeah, that's another thing to, I probably should have mentioned is that we have, aside from these 330 acres, we have another, I don't know, um, hundred acres or so that get paid to bring in some, um, some pretty probably low nutritional quality hay, uh, cause we're not haying it until, um, about August. Um, so it's, it's not really providing them a ton of nutrition, but it is just kind of giving them something to munch on. Uh, we also want to try to maintain bison in the wild would lose 10 to 20 percent of their body weight during the winter. Um, we don't want fat bison that are not losing a little weight during the winter. So we want to try to keep that natural selection process of losing weight in the winter and then putting it on in the spring. So 
we try to, you know, not not give them like some fresh alfalfa or anything like that. So. And that hay, Molly, it's it's prairie hay, yep. right? That you're. Yeah. But just from a different part of the park. So it's not hay, like you just said, it's not like yeah. alfalfa oats or other things. It's right. It's prairie. What they it's like to prairie eat. and brome old fields. So <laughs> it's hard to avoid having brome in a prairie. <laughs> yes. We are trying not to. We're just going to have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Craig. For me, um, in addition to supplemental feeding, and I can probably speak for Ashley too, those 800 pound round bales um, allow the park manager to sleep at night when you've got two weeks of 18 inches of snow and cold temps, knowing that the bison aren't going to be testing the fences because they do have that supplemental food source. Um, I would be interested to know, and I don't I don't know if work's been done on it, but in terms of rotational grazing, knowing how much the bison will pick at woody cover, the dogwood, the sumac, during the winter months, what, if they were moved into a paddock that was flush with the woody cover, the woody stems, what kind of impact that would have to, to what we're trying to control at Miniopa. Um, but I'm not aware of any, any research that's been done on that. Basically doing a um, adaptive management grazing model with the bison, where you move them into a smaller paddock and then move them out, essentially. Uh, let's ask this grazing timing question, and then we're going to end with the visiting the park question, and then we're just going to wrap really quick. So we'll have to quickly answer grazing timing. And because tomorrow we're going to be covering managing prairies with Savannah, First, managing prairies and savannas with grazing and fire, like the whole big picture. We can elaborate on this some tomorrow. So, Molly, real quick, do you want to um, answer this? We have a few large areas that we are essentially recreating prairie from scratch. Do you have recommendations for how long to wait before introducing grazing disturbance? Yeah, I don't have a magic number, but I would say get your weeds under control uh, before you would bring in because they are going to disturb and so like i you saw the mullen in the pictures we've had mullen at miniopa forever and we do mullen pulls and that is one thing like that mullen seed is already in our seed bed so then when we cut a cedar down or the bison create a new wallow that mullen seed can now come and germinate so i would say just really make sure you've got your weeds in under control and in your seed bed, kind of exhausted of those weeds um, before you bring in this grazing disturbance. So I'm not going to give you a, like an actual like wait three years or anything like that. It'll depend on your prairie and what your restoration, um, you know, what you seeded it with. But just make sure you've got those weeds under control. And sometimes we've had uh, areas too where the people uh, are working with cattle and not bison and they're trying to switch to all native forage and so they need that pasture space and we've run the cows through right after planting basically uh, to try both mm -hmm. to try to push some of the seeds in and um, just they need to utilize that space so there are I think like anything with restoration, there's no one set way to do it. There's all kinds of recipes and how the land responds is going to tell you a lot about what decision you need to make in the future. All right, we're going to end with visiting the park, the best time of year to visit this park. Glenn, we're, we're just going to round around with all of you because you're all going to have maybe a different answer. So, so Glenn, when is the best time to visit Miniopa? Oh, you're muted. So you're talking to me, but I can't hear you. In the spring when the babies are there. <laughs> I love it. Craig. I'm going to go fall during the middle of the week to experience the fall prairie colors without the influx of people. Got Kadelka. I'm going to go with winter just because I love winter. And I think it's so much easier to see the bison. And as you alluded to, you can get to car wash at the same time. <laughs> Ashley. 
I'm I'm going to really say all the above. I really think it's important to visit Miniopa in all seasons because it is so different in every season. There's something new to find and see depending upon the time of year you're here. I, the most common question I get is when is the best time to see the bison? And a lot of folks don't realize that they are out there year round. So, and they have different areas that they prefer and different, you know, behaviors that you can see. Um, this was my first winter at Miniopa. And one of the things that I found really exciting was actually watching them just shovel through the snow to find things to browse. So I, I think it's important that if you really are passionate about the bison is to come and visit in each season at least once to see them and visit everything Miniopa has to offer because it does change. Molly, you get the final word on this. I was going to say on Wednesdays when the park is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but if the range isn't open to the public on Wednesday. I am a key, so <laughs> <laughs> that's when we go right. and do our resource work is on Wednesdays, like no public to deal with. So, uh, uh, but I will say go out during a snowstorm because it's really fun to see them like they, they love the snowstorms. It's just fun to see them out there. That's what they're built for in their element. So it's really fun to see them then. Yeah, I did just read a, a paper where somebody was saying, watch a bison in the snow. And they have, you know, all those clumps of matted snow on them, which I always thought meant that they were really cold. But the article was like, that shows you how much heat they're not losing from their body. Like how good their fur is at insulating them because... You don't have that patch of snow that's melting on them. You get the clumps because they're really well insulated. Okay, well, that is all for day one. We're going to be right back here tomorrow, 8.30 to 11.30. We're going to dig really deep into management, all of your management questions. We're going to put the big picture together. Today we focused on bison and kind of getting you introduced to the park and the partnerships. And then we're also going to hear from everybody, all of the panelists, about things that they've struggled with at Miniopa, things they would do differently, and their advice for future managers, which I think is something that is really important as a land manager to hear, you know. And it, what I also liked as we were doing the interviews for this with the videos is that everybody had a different answer. No, nobody gave the same set of advice. And so I think that's really important because it shows that there's a lot of perspectives that are partnering in this work. Uh, Becky's going to type into the chat our, um, what's it called, our evaluation link. And then I just want to offer a big thank you to Becky Esser, Tom Skilling, Jess Dowler. I hate doing this list because I'm going to forget someone. Craig Meyer. <laughs> I've already forgotten someone, I'm sure. Uh, all of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative folks and all of our panelists, Gwen Westerman, Craig Beckman, Molly Trannell Nelson, Ashley Stevens, and of course, Scott Kadelka, retired, but still making a difference. So we're just going to give you guys this round of applause here because you did really, really amazing. We hope you all join us tomorrow, bright and early. Uh, Carly, did you have a question quick or did I miss it? We'll hang out here too if people have some last minute, like, Oh, I really need to ask you this. <laughs> so we'll hang out for like five minutes. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>